the Buddha compares the discernment that comes from meditation to the skills of being a good archer. You're able to shoot long distances, fire accurate shots in rapid succession, and pierce great masses. In other words, you see the long-term results of what you're doing, or of different possible courses of action, so you can choose which is going to be the best in the long term. That's shooting great distances, firing accurate shots in rapid succession. That's being very clear about what's going on in the mind. And because the mind can change so quickly, you want to be able to see it very quickly. Piercing great masses, that's piercing the mass of ignorance. Now, as you know, to be a good archer, you have to have a really good concentrated mind. If you're aiming to be good, you have to be able to stare at the topic, <coughs> stare at the target for long periods of time without wavering, without blinking. And similar to the quality of mind that makes a good potter. I was watching a potter one time in Thailand, making a pot on a wheel. And I mentioned to him, he said, you must have good concentration. He said, your mind has to be constant. In other words, you can't waver. So this is one of the reasons why we're working on concentration. is to get that steady, constant quality that enables our discernment to do its work. And what is the work of discernment? It's to understand our cravings. As we chanted just now, the mind is usually a slave to craving. We're a slave to craving because we don't understand it. We haven't pierced it. We haven't watched it quickly as it changes, carefully enough. So often we misunderstand our own cravings. What happens is that we become a person that sometimes we don't even recognize. A certain craving takes over, and as the Buddha says, craving leads to becoming. And what is becoming? It's when you create an identity in a certain world of experience, or take on an identity based on your desires. The identity here is either the you who's going to enjoy the results of the desire, or else the you who's going to be able to produce those results. This is why the Buddha has us ask every day, days and nights fly past, fly past, what am I becoming right now? Okay, what you're becoming depends on your desires and your cravings. And if you don't know them, then even what you are gets out of your control. Sometimes people come Asking, who am I? That's the big spiritual question, we're told. Or what's the purpose of life? What's the meaning of life? And the Buddhist answer is basically, you are what you define yourself to be. And your purpose in life is what you decide it's going to be. There is no overarching purpose to the universe. Remember the Buddha's vision of the universe is just going through many cycles, around and around and around. It goes nowhere. And the beings within the universe, they go around and around, they wander here and there, but keep coming back and then going on and coming back again. And if they don't get out, they don't go anywhere. And as for what you are, that keeps changing in line with your desires. Now, some people find this scary, but the Buddha saw that this was an opportunity. You can define your desires in such a way that you give your meaning to your life, a meaning that's good. If there were an overall purpose to the universe, you'd have to serve that purpose, regardless of what that purpose meant in terms of your, your health, well-being, happiness. The question of putting an end to your suffering would have to be put off to the side, because you'd have to serve some other purpose. But here with the universe being meaningless, you can give meaning to your life by saying, I want to put an end to suffering. Then you can define yourself around that. Make that your desire. Now you find, of course, that the members of the Committee of the Mind have lots of other desires as well. And 
most of which are based on very strange ideas of what's possible out there. Because that's one thing you can't simply make up your mind the way things are going to be. You can't make up your mind to say that you're going to be a sex addict and have perfect happiness. The universe doesn't work that way. Your mind doesn't work that way. This is why we have the teachings on the principles of action, to remind us that this is how things work. You act on this kind of desire or this kind of motivation, it's going to have these kinds of results. You have this kind of intention, you act on it, it'll have those kinds of results. The Buddha lays it out and then says, it's up to us. What do you want to choose? The other thing he lays out is, what's well, possible? I mean, the example of his life is that it is possible to put an end to suffering, and you can do it in a way that doesn't harm anybody else. In fact, you look at his life, he created a lot of good for the world. He set out the Dharma, showed people that they can put an end to their own suffering, created a monastic order so could, this skill could be taught from generation to generation as a living tradition. He did a lot of work. He showed us this is what human beings can do. So it's good that we keep that in mind, because the rest of the world wants to close off a lot of options. Not only the world outside of the Dharma, you see what passes as Buddhism here in the West. A lot of the teachers are trying to close off a lot of the options that the Buddha opened. Fortunately, you can't close them. But people were looking for them, they're there. Then you have the opportunity to define yourself. What are you becoming right now? And so you, when you make up your mind that this is what you want to do, you want to put an end to suffering, as I said, you have to deal with the other yous in there that are created around different desires. And this is why we have to fire shots in rapid succession and be accurate, because our cravings are very subtle, as we're talking about today in the class. You may think you desire one thing or have a craving for one thing, but then when you get it, you realize that that's not what you wanted. If you're lusting for a particular person, say, you think that the person is the object of your desire. Well, if you get the person, then you realize, well, it wasn't quite that way. This is not the person I thought I was getting. This is not the story I thought I was getting. So you have to look back again. What was it that you were actually, actually desiring? What was your craving aimed at? Because it shifts very quickly. Maybe it be the narrative you had, the fantasies you had. Around what exactly got you interested? What was the hook? The same with anger. You're angry because things are a certain way. And you want to have them changed. Well, suppose you actually got them changed. You might realize that that doesn't really satisfy you. It was something else. Something else had you worked up. And so here you are, being defined by your desires, and you don't even know what your desires are. So we got the mind really quiet so we can see these shifts in the desire. And John Mahabhava talks about this. He contemplated the foulness of the body as a way of overcoming lust, and Gatsu was really quick at it. But then he realized the problem wasn't with the object. There was something in his mind that liked the perception of beauty. So it wasn't, wasn't the body of this person or that person out there, it was this being hooked on the perception of beauty, something totally internal. Think about this for a minute. We create lots of havoc, not only in our own lives, but also in the lives of others, simply because we don't even know what our desires are. We think we want something, and we find out, well, that's not what I want. And we move through life like this, creating a huge mess. So getting to know your own desires and getting some control over them, and sitting down very quietly with a mind that's really steady solid, and looking at what do you really want in life. You've got the choice. Choose it well. So 
ultimately, of course, as the Buddha said, the best thing to do is go beyond becoming this person or becoming that person. With our hunts, as he says, you can't define them. And I guess people define themselves around their desires and their attachments. And for someone who has no desires and no attachments, I guess they found true happiness. They can't be defined. Which means that for them, the question of who are they is as a non-question. As for purpose in life, they've achieved that purpose. No further purposes. And for those of us who are still on the path, the good news is we get to choose our purpose. The bad news is we get to choose our purpose. In other words, if we're really sloppy in our choice, as I say, be careful what you want because you might get it. So you want to train yourself, both in terms of the concentration to see things steadily and the discernment that can shoot great distances, seeing, okay, if I choose this course of action, this is where it's really going to go. Instead of our muddled perceptions where we're thinking, well, I think I want this person or I think I want this situation, and you try to get it and it doesn't turn out to be what you thought it was. Or it was what it was, but you had other ideas. You were actually fixated on something else. So this ability to fire shots in rapid succession actually connects with that ability to shoot great distances, to pierce great masses. You clean up your own life, you give it a good direction, and you stop making a mess of other people's lives. This is why this is a good path. It's good not only for you, but for the people around you, that you are following this path. So try to take advantage of the freedom you have. You get to define yourself, you get to define the purpose of your life. You keep the Buddha's options in mind as to what the possibilities are, and make the best choice you can. <laughs>